questions about your book. And then uh, after sort of half an hour or so, we will then open up for questions from those who are following us online. And uh, hopefully, Carolyn will be able to uh, assist us uh, with those asking questions. So um, I hope that uh, is clear on how we're going to move and how we're going to have this conversation. Patrick, it's great to see you as always. Can I just ask, um, begin by asking you, what prompted you to write the book after you've written three other books about boards and governance? Yeah, well, just, just a, a, a comment on the weather first. It's 12 degrees here, Milton, and it's absolutely <laughs> pouring and howling wind. So <laughs> I am de deeply envious. Um, so, so to the book, I, I, I did write a number of books a number of years ago, and um, I, I kind of had a break from it. I, I got bored of doing new editions. And I thought, well, you know, three is probably enough on the topic. What, what more is there to say? Um, but then over the years, obviously, things have developed. Things have changed. I had some new things I wanted to, um, to say. And also a number of people were, were asking me to, to sort of, you know, uh, get going again and, and do something different. And uh, initially, the, the, the first edition of Boards was published literally weeks before COVID and then so I did another edition much more quickly than I've anticipated to obviously reflect uh, what's happened in the world, not just with COVID, but, um, but since, uh, since the beginning of, of 2020. So it was driven by a mix of demand and feeling that I had some new things to say. And um, you uh, published this book just weeks before COVID and um, that has prompted you to release an updated version, um, taking into consideration the phenomenon of Zoom meetings. Um, tell us about that. Yeah, so uh, I mean, as a chair myself for a number of organizations, um, it's been a hugely challenging time to chair anything, whether that's a business, a social enterprise, a, you know, a government body, whatever it might be. Um, and. I couldn't have survived, I don't think, and, and you know, I, I think in part the organisations that, that I that I chosen as well, without that peer network and without the ideas and the different ways that people were approaching those challenging circumstances. And so I also felt there were a couple of trends which were well underway before the pandemic, like what I call this move from a maps to a sat nav world, like the diversity uh, agenda like changes to the way boards are making decisions. And I, I just felt all of that actually was moving a pace and it was worth not doing it too quickly. So I only released the update in uh, towards the end of last year, uh, 2021, because I thought, you, you know, if you react too soon, you might get it completely wrong and it needs time to reflect. Um, and maybe we'll talk about reflection later and its importance, but I just felt actually it was would be quite helpful to have something and, and, and as ever with writing, you know, you help yourself quite a lot when you do this because you're forced to research, you're forced to think, reflect. And so I, I, I learned a lot myself from just going through that process. I know that the, having gone through the book myself, I, I've seen uh, some of the segments that you've divided uh, the book into uh, uh, purpose, uh, people, and um, there's a bit uh, towards the end where you talk about dilemmas that boards face and you've got some practical examples there. But I like um, you, I would love you to talk to us about the dynamic budgeting in time of these variant uncertainties. And I like you touched on a bit uh, on it just now, the SATNEV approach. Uh, I, I love yeah. that you expand on that. Yeah, so it's quite common in the venture capital uh, space and in early stage ventures to have a more flexible approach to, to budgeting. I mean, you do have an annual budget, but you probably have more of a what I call a lockstep approach. Uh, also, with the rise of big data and more importantly, big data analytics and the greater uncertainty that we've all faced in the last couple of years, I think we've all felt more comfortable as a board making decisions closer to junctions with the latest information, just like you do in a set nav. Um, and having an approach which is kind of 
you know, you're planning for the long term, you're doing all those things, but you're actually taking decisions when you need to with the latest information uh, just seems to make a lot of a lot of sense. But if you're rooted in that very classic, um, you know, religion of a very, very detailed strategic plan for for the next five years and a very, very detailed budget where your spending is calendar based rather than consequence based, if you, if you like, I, I felt you know, that that shift would be accelerated by the pandemic. And indeed, it was uh, very, very significantly, because it's not easy for everyone to adapt to that. You need a finance function that can cope with it. But it's a mindset more than a system, uh, if you like. And I think it's very interesting watching how the best boards and the best organisations have been more agile. And some of those have been deploying these, these techniques, these ways of and making decisions, not leaving it to the last minute, but leaving it to the right time. Uh, so that, that, that's what that's all about. And the rise of big data, we are all inundated by big data from our mobile phones to our laptops and iPads and um, uh, all the stuff that goes with it. Um, how might this influence boards in being data savvy? I know you've dealt with it a bit in the book. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, as a mathematician and, and being mildly dyslexic, I much prefer mathematical symbols for conveying ideas. And for those of you that remember from school or from now, your normal distribution, the bell curve, uh, I think if you look at effectiveness and data savviness, um, you know, you can be data devoid uh, and, 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 you know, you've just got to rely on good luck and, and instinct to make decisions in that case. You can be data drunk at the other end of the spectrum where you're just paralyzed by the amount of data you've got and you don't understand it, or you can be data savvy uh, somewhere in the middle where you, you, know, you, you understand what data you need to have to make the decisions you want to take. You understand the data that's presented to you when you're making those decisions and you can understand uh, and system think if you like, rather than just looking at a data point, you're looking at the data on what it means and where that might flow uh, in, in consequences. I personally don't think that many boards and many board recruiters have focused enough on data savviness um, over, over time. We, we test, we focus on all sorts of other things, but you know, fundamentally the ability to understand numbers uh, doesn't mean you have to be a statistical genius, but understanding the differences between causation and correlation and what is a significant sample and you know what that data really means um, is, is pretty fundamental to informing your judgments. And talking about data, um, uh, I read a bit in the book about uh, social media and governance. How should boards be navigating it and uh, the difference between healthy skepticism and cynicism? I particularly find uh, Twitter to be incredibly toxic, uh, to be honest, uh, compared to Instagram, for instance. Yeah, so I, I think as a board, what you, it's a bit like with culture, really. You know, you, you want to know what culture you've got, what culture you want and how to get from one to the other if they're different. And social media, actually, you need to know as a board what people are saying about you. So you, you can't just say, um, you know, this, this is for, it doesn't really matter to us because it does. Um, it does matter what people are saying. Also, you can use social media to inform your decisions. So ESSA, for example, we've just done a great piece of work with one of our partners, Quilt AI, which is, trying to understand what young people in tertiary institutions, universities and colleges in Africa think about the world of work. And you could do a survey, but I suspect the response rate would be tiny. Uh, or you could listen to what young people are saying on social media about that. There, there may well be a negative bias to it, but you can adjust for that. And you can actually understand from um, big data analytics what young people are searching for when they search for jobs or employment or careers. And we, we were able to survey very quickly, you know, a massive number of young people in, in six different African countries and discover what they were currently 
saying and, and in part thinking about the, the world of work, which is very useful information if you're trying to support young people to, you know, make the most of the opportunities that, they, that, that are out there. So I think it's both. You need to understand what people are saying and doing and thinking. There's a defensive aspect, uh, but there's also an opportunity aspect and spot trends. Sorry, Milton, have we lost you? Yes, I'm sorry, that was me. Um, Milton, you're back on. Okay, that's fine, yes. I was just saying that uh, ESSA, by the way, is uh, Education Sub-Saharan Africa, which Patrick chairs, which looks into the broad spectrum of education and the needs of particular faculties by country, by age, by gender, and so on. But uh, Patrick can elaborate on it uh, a bit later. Patrick, I couldn't help but notice that you are a very strong supporter of women. You dedicated this book to your mother, Margaret, and you quote your grandmother, and you remind us of what Maya Angelou taught us. I'm a big fan of poetry, and when I saw in page 88, 89, your uh, uh, quoting Maya Angelou, I was filled with a bit of optimism. Mama, uh, Mama. I've learned, I've learned that people will forget what you said, what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. That's the Maya Angelou quote in the book. I also loved your grandmother's advice, Patrick. Uh, it's really important to listen to what people say, but it's even more important to listen to what they think. So um, perhaps this is an opportune moment uh, for us, Patrick, to hear uh, you read an excerpt from the book. Uh, perhaps we can go to page 89 um, of the first edition, which is what I have. And it's 87 of the second edition. Um, it's about boards and feelings. Yeah, thanks. Th thanks, Phil. So this is very short, don't worry. So what, what I've said here is it, it isn't a very boardroom thing to talk about feelings. But as research suggests, feelings transmit much quicker than ideas and that feelings are an important driver of behaviour. So it seems worth looking at some relevant aspects of feelings. And one of those aspects is how mood might affect performance. Earlier in my career, when I hadn't learned that, I'd made many a mistake by believing that the power of logic of an argument would win out as long as I just kept repeating it and sometimes repeating it louder. Uh, there is now a whole area of research into what is delightfully known as emotional contagion. Sounds very negative, doesn't it? Both physically and through electronic media. High performers in the arts and in sports and other aspects of life put a lot of thought and effort into being in the right condition and getting into the right zone before the big event. Perhaps we should do the same when making major decisions that affect not only our livelihoods, but also those of others. Greater awareness of the links between well being, both physical and mental, are welcome. Matthew Walker's Why We Sleep is a very good entree to this topic if you haven't explored it. I then go on and talk about something I call asymmetric sym symmetry, uh, sensitivity, uh, which, which is really quite interesting how some people are uh, ex expect other people to be incredibly sensitive towards them, but are themselves incredibly insensitive <laughs> towards other people. Oh, that's fantastic. That's really powerful. And I quite like the idea that you as an author are also interested in what other people are writing and you have a list of recommendations. I think one of the book is the art of stats, statistics and um, uh, which you mentioned the basic understanding of causation and correlation there and dark data, um, which is that most organizations only use 10% of the data they've got. And there's another one, uh, is it uh, thinking fast and slow? Um, mm, Daniel Kahneman. Yeah, tell us about that list of uh, books that also inspires you uh, to uh, give us all the uh, thinking about boards. Yeah, so, I mean, those ones are the ones around data, but I have, lots of other suggestions around behavior, particularly things like managing different cultures. I think Erin Meyer's Culture Map is a, is a brilliant book. Uh, you know, I think Behave by Robert Sapolsky is very good at understanding the basics of how humans interact. And body language in boards 
you know, especially in a virtual environment, is a, is a real um, science and it's a real art as well to be able to bring out the best of people to spot signals, to see into thought bubbles and think, you know, that person doesn't look so happy. I wonder what's in there. I need to, 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 to bring that out. I, um, although I, I, I am mildly dyslexic and I found reading incredibly difficult as a, as a child, um, I just loved biographies. I loved uh, learning about other people. I, I came from a very poor part of a big city here called Liverpool. Um, it's like if you're in Johannesburg, it's like the Alex of the UK. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a pretty, pretty tough place, but a, but a great place to learn about people. And as a kid, uh, I always watched. I was a very um, uh, keen people watcher, sometimes so I could keep myself out of danger. <laughs> Um, but but also I could learn, and and I was so privileged when I got lucky and got a got a good start in in business to learn from some fantastic people. So I'm always interested in what other people are saying, what other people are thinking, what other people are writing, and that has really helped me enormously uh, over the years. I, even if I miss sentences and I can miss paragraphs and I can miss words when I'm reading, so I generally read things three or four times. Um, I have to read board papers four times uh, to make sure I don't miss anything. I, I'm terrified of missing something. So I, I, I always, I have little techniques for making sure I haven't missed things, but uh, reading's always been a joy for me, even though it's been a challenge. Yeah, I'm fascinated by um, what you said there, because there is a general perception that if you are a white middle-aged man from Europe, you come from uh, a, a background of uh, wealth and uh, that, that sort of thing. But actually you uh, come from Liverpool and uh, you went through pretty much all the steps that the kids in Alex and Soweto where I come from also uh, go through. Yeah, although I wouldn't say for one moment that Toxteth, where I was born, was anything like as challenging as, as Alex, really. Uh, there's a, there's, it's a different thing. Um, it was a violent place, um, but, it, but not quite as, 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 as challenging at all. I think it teaches you humility when you come from a place like that. Also, uh, people's expectations can be very low. Of you, so no one in our street worked, so I wasn't expected to, to work or do anything like that. Uh, <laughs> well, work in legal, in a legal sense. Uh, and, and so what I found was that if I had a little measure of success, I always imagined what I could do then. So I, I have this expression now, I, I was doing something the other day with the oh. EY Foundation. Hey, hello. Hello, Quebec. <laughs> um, and, uh, I, I, we, I was giving some awards and, and, and saying to the young people, you know, this is a fantastic thing and you should really be proud and you should enjoy this moment, but don't waste the moment. Use the moment to imagine what you can do now. Now you've made this step, what other steps are possible? Don't quit when you've got a medal. Uh, you know, go for a better medal, uh, a different medal, uh, a bigger medal. Um, and, that, and that always, that drive actually has, has never left me. And that's what I enjoyed about the book myself, because there are so many teachable moments, just like what you just shared with us there. You kind of learn so much, uh, uh, not just about the technicality of chairman versus CEO and executive directors and so on, but you, you, you get the, the wisdom out of it, which I'm, I was eternally grateful for. And thank you for um, uh, writing it in that sort of way uh, for people like us to uh, you know, sort of soak up the wisdom out of it. Now, talking about, you know, growing up in, in Liverpool and so on, um, board diversity and uh, board consultancy, um, uh, what are the readaptation and reflection approaches there for you? I think um, from my first steps on, on working with boards, when I was quite young and I, I was managing a portfolio in a, in a private equity business and interaction, I always felt it was important to get different views. And I also noticed, particularly in the UK at that time, 
thought diversity was, was shocking, both in terms of gender, race, social uh, class, as, as, as it was called then, uh, disability. It's still shocking that there are so few disabled people on boards anywhere in the world. Um, very, very few, yet disabled people make up you know, a significant part of our, of our populations. I also found when I was on the Higgs Review, which led to the creation of the Senior Independent Director and the 30% Club and things like that, that um, what was interesting was that the, the, the narrow social groups that board members come from, even on race and gender, they're still very, very narrow. And so I was consciously trying to find ways to, um, to in increase diversity. And next gen boards, which we, we may come on to, is one way to do this. Having creating some sort of pipeline uh, is, is really, really important to me. And in, in most of the organizations, you know, I, I, I've chaired and I, I try and promote the cause for, for getting these, these younger boards, getting developing younger people, giving them you know, uh, trustee positions or board appointments in smaller organizations as a way of their development. So they understand what being on the top board of something uh, is, is like. That can be much more um, instructive than being on a subsidiary board sometimes. Actually, I, I would like you to tell us about um, something I saw there, which was quite inspiring and fascinating, uh, the Gucci board. So I'd like mm. you to, uh, I, I know people will find that in the book when they buy it and read it, but um, it's good just for you perhaps to give us a snippet of using the next gen uh, as advisory board. And you also work with the uh, young people in the EY foundation, which you chair. Yeah, so uh, the Gucci example is a great one. Uh, it's not a new one. That's partly why it's great because it stood the test of time. But Gucci a number of years ago was concerned that it, it uh, concerned about the future really, fantastic positioning, um, but it was worried about would it appeal to the younger generations? So it formed a, a, a sort of next generation board um, with younger people from within and, uh, and outside the business. And it shared the board papers with them, um, shared each other's thinking. And one of the things that that next gen board came up with very early, and actually, you know, this was a, a little while ago, so it was uh, it was not as obvious as it is today. They basically said, you know, look, um, Gucci needs a proper digital strategy, and it needs the right strategy. And actually, the current board probably aren't the people to basically, you know, they were quite sort of. Um, uppity in that wonderfully refreshing youthful way uh you know you got you old guys probably aren't the people to, to decide this so we've got some ideas and they basically um you know prodded the board into recognizing they need to invest in digital early and also engage younger people in the process of deciding what that strategy should be which they did and then over the ensuing five maybe more years gucci way outperformed uh, it's, it's obvious successes, uh, obviously it's competitors, sorry. Um, and one of the key reasons for that was its digital uh, offerings. So I think that's a very good example. I mean, I think uh, Interbrands, a well-known kind of brand consultancy, they've got a very effective, um, they call it Horizon Board because they're looking out to the future. Um, it's, it's a next-gen board, it's, it's called Horizon. Um, that's very effective. The FT have got one. Um, they're springing up all over the place now, and I think is a very healthy thing. It's not always easy to manage, um, but for example, at the UI Foundation, we have a youth advisory board. The chair and the vice chair of that sit on the main board. So as we describe it, you know, young people are not only at the heart of what we do, they're also at the head of what we do, uh, and they're informing our decision making greatly, I think. Um, this brings me to... Um a great deal of your uh, passion um, uh, about education in Africa. You uh, founded the Warwick University Africa program uh, for which you uh, invited me onto its uh, South African trust. And as, as a board member, there's a trustee, um, which I have uh, uh, had an incredible time um, helping young people teach mathematics and English. 
and it's been just a fantastic experience. Now, um, Africa has another inspiration for you. You get ideas from here, which you see in townships and far-flung corners of Limpopo, uh, where you've been up in the north of South Africa in, in the rural heartland. And you sometimes take them back to uh, Europe, to the UK, to the West, to America, and see if they would work there. And you see ideas over there that you think might work here. Tell us about that sort of concept in uh, approaching uh, boards. Yeah, I, I've I've operated in um, you know the highly commercial sector in private equity. Uh, I've done quite a lot of stuff in the social sector. I've been on the board of the university, and what I've always found is that people from a different place just bring a whole different way of looking at a problem. And so I, I remember uh, one day actually being in Cliptown rather than Alex, but Cliptown is a much smaller version of Alex's many of you will will know as a, as a township. And um, a young woman talking to me about what it felt like to be, she, she was stunningly clever. And she just, she'd been a work in Africa, she'd got into university and was, you know, really doing well. But she found it quite challenging. And, and it was to do with imposter syndrome. It was to do with not having the same shared experiences as of, as others, and uh, and and I knew what that felt like in a different in a different context. And I, I went back and I, I remember talking at, um, to my colleagues and saying, you know, when we recruit people, we, we we've been recruiting people from more diverse backgrounds. Are we really doing enough to support them in that early stage? And um, you don't want to have a, a badge of stigma attached with people who come from a poorer background or people who are from a different group. You want to sort of, it's probably just as important to help the other people understand what disadvantages they have, uh, as well as those people who are more obviously disadvantaged. Because what I found throughout my career is that often the people from the most challenged backgrounds are the more resilient. And so one of the things I started to do is to get young people coming in who, who were from difficult backgrounds to coach people who hadn't had that privilege of having, uh, having had those, those challenges. And that was really in, enlightened and instructive, I think. Helped everybody. Oh, that's brilliant. Um, <clears throat> the uh, other thing I noticed in the book that you have, the way you've structured it, actually, it's in triangular form. You have this love of triangles. Where did you get that idea? Where does that come from? It, it, it comes from a, being a child and obviously finding writing difficult. I used to use symbols a lot. So one of my real favorites is a Venn diagram, but, but I've used that so much uh, in all sorts of board settings. But the triangle, I think, I mean, triangle's contribution to humanity is much underrated. You know, you think of um, architecture, you think of navigation, you think of so many aspects of our life are dependent upon the triangle. Those of you that are really into computer games, you know, your graphics would not work without triangle technology. Um, mm. that, that's absolutely implicit within it. But one of the things from a humanity point of view that the triangle is very good at is most humans find it very easy to remember three things, but hard to remember more. Most problems are better solved by breaking them down into their component parts, trying to rather than trying to solve the big complicated problem. So I, I, I first used triangles in a board sense when I went to an appalling board meeting. It was a family company. It was in a mess. Um, and I, I went along to this board meeting and I, I said I'd have a chat with the chair after the meeting. You know, we were an investor in the company, not a majority investor, only 15 percent. And I, I went into his, his room after the, this terrible board meeting. And I said in my best English, you know, that was a really interesting meeting, Jack, which, which in English means that was a real disaster. Um, you know, <laughs> back to my grand, you know, what people think and what they say are not always the same. Um, and as he was talking and we, we got on really well and he was talking about all the problems, I drew a big triangle on my notepad 
uh, and I put purpose, people and process in the corners because it seemed to me that all of the issues that he was wrestling with were to do with a lack of clarity of purpose for the organisation and for the board, how the board and the exec interacted, you know, what was the point of the exec and what was the point of the board and where do they interact? And then they had the wrong people working together in the wrong way. So that seemed like a sort of fairly obvious thing. And then the underpinning processes of, you know, what should go on the agenda, how the meeting was managed, what was in the papers, um, the decision-making process, all of that was not really good. So I thought that a way we could move forward is if we looked at purpose, people and process, we could make parallel progress on those three things. And then we could sort of, help sort the board issues out. And, and from that very day, I use my purpose, people and process triangle as a due diligence tool. And either I've been looking at an investment or I've been thinking about joining a board. And when I've been thinking about reviewing how we are doing as a board when you're an established chair. So the triangle is, is a big thing for, for me. Um, and I, I, do, I do quite a bit of research on triangles really interested in triangles bit, bit geeky i know but there you go but one of the things of course that uh, made the book so readable uh, so easy is indeed that sort of segmentation in that format in a triangular uh, format so um it's fantastic and i'm I'm certain that uh, people when they pick up uh, boards they would they would uh, find uh, it as uh, fantastic as i did um the other thing that I've seen personally about you um, since working with you for many years is the energy, the positivity, the idea of keeping the positive spirit uh, up and front so that everybody that you, there's sort of fewer moments of negativity, darkness, you know, low energy, uh, when you are around. And that's what you actually advocate uh, in the book as well, um, which is your sort of um, mantra. You live through positivity. You're always constructive, always looking on the bright side of life. I can't help it. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I suppose that comes, that does come from my mum. Um, but it also comes from... Um, mm belief in humanity and despite what's going on at the moment and despite some of the horrendous things that humans mm. do to each other um i've always found that um you it's much better to make your own choices i i'm hugely moved by you know the long walk to freedom mandela's book that's one, one i reread many times i think i have um, it if you can look just uh, up there we're, uh, we're, we're brothers <laughs> um, and you know he wasn't a perfect guy um, but you know that is an inspiring book and I think that it's too easy to wallow uh, what though you have to recognize is that you know life's introverts and people who look at downsides are incredibly valuable to society and I think you know thinking about risk and uh, and that is a, is a positive thing. But being negative towards other people is a very negative thing. O on the risk thing, I, I always think another thing my, my grand told me that was really wonderful was never ever confuse worrying with thinking. So you might have a problem and you could sit there going, oh no, this is going to be dreadful. You know, if you've got to fire someone, oh God, this is going to be difficult. You know, fine to do it for a little bit, that's human. But don't confuse it with thinking. Thinking is, you know, well, where should we have this conversation? What should my first words be? How might they react? What will I do? What, you know, and being really prepared. So I've always been, believed in responding rather than reacting um, in, 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 in situations. And, and even if I waste time thinking ahead, um, I'd rather do that than wing it. Um, you know, we've all had to deal with the consequences of people who, who wing it. Um, I guess that's particularly true in the media, Milton. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, um, you know, uh, as we come to the end of this uh, session, we're about to open it up now to the audience uh, so that they can 
get an opportunity to ask their own questions. But um, I can't help it, Patrick. You know, you and I have got a love for football uh, beyond uh, our seriousness on uh, education on the African continent. Um, and my uh, frustrations about Arsenal and Orlando Pirates, <laughs> which uh, I share with you sometimes. Um, how, how, in your view, um, uh, can that actually help people who sit on boards that they should have other activities uh, beyond the boardroom where they get inspiration, which they can then bring back to the board where they can share with committees and directors and CFOs and so on? Well, I, I, I'd hate to say it, Milton, but it's back to the mathematics um, <laughs> and it's back to the normal distribution because if you think, you know, there's a uh, effectiveness and pressure as a, as a curve, uh, no pressure, no effect, too much pressure, bad outcomes. The right amount of pressure, really good. And I think having other interests, having other passions, getting out and about, being physically okay, will help you to achieve the right level of pressure so you can be as effective as you can. And you'll never be boring if you're curious. Um, you'll never be boring if you've got other interests. Now, one problem is that if you're very enthusiastic about your interests, you know, you, you might love to talk about them, but other people might think, bloody hell, that's boring. <laughs> so, what, if, what will they stop going on about that? Uh, and so I, um, I've always found it kind of a good thing to, to get out and do other stuff. Well, thank you very much, Patrick. And uh, I don't know if people can give a round of applause if possible, but uh, this is fantastic uh, stuff. Um, thank you so much. Um, we are now going to ask the audience, I don't know, Carolyn, how you want to uh, go about it. Uh, do we have people who want to ask questions, areas perhaps that I did not touch on? Remember, we want you to go and read more about the book yourself having bought it but um uh, there exactly. are certainly yeah. uh, uh yes. with such a, a thick book um uh, there's so much that we haven't touched on that we think you should be um doing it yourself but um we're open now for questions uh, yeah anyone? There's, there's some good ones coming through milton already yes there um, are yeah so um, shall I have a go at a few? Or yeah, any yeah. Well, I, I just Sorry. wanted to ask, uh, Justina has got a very good question. Justina, if you're online still, if you'd like to ask um, Patrick your question, I think it's something everybody wants to know about. Oh, thank you so much, um, Patrick. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Looking forward to reading the second edition of the book. My question was, um, have you noticed any differences between private equity and listed PLC boards, especially post pandemic? Thank you. Yeah, so there's a there are, I mean, 3i where I was for, for many years is a is both a public company and a private equity business. So it was always interesting. We lived with that. Uh, every day. So I think the major difference is usually you're, you're, you have a, a much narrower sort of shareholder base, obviously, and particularly if it's a majority equity stake that the private equity firm has, you usually have your main shareholder sitting around the table. So you don't have that chain of communication, if you like, if you're in a big public company, and you don't have, you have obviously a lot of regulation, but you don't have quite the same level of regular re regulation. Um, the board in a, in a private equity backed situation would typically tend to be an independent chair. Um, some representatives from the private equity firm and probably one or two independent independent directors. The board in a public company would probably have the majority being independent directors. So that's, that produces a very different uh, dynamic too. I think in the, uh, in the pandemic period, my experience in working with a number of private equity firms through that time was they were very focused on protecting long-term value and looking for opportunities out of the crisis. In the public company environment, I think those things were the same, but they also had to have concern about their share price and the vulnerability that they might face, because if they, you know, they could be bid for at a steal of a price, uh, through a moment of dis disruption like that. Uh, also, 
uh, I think what was very interesting was the, um, the, the private equity firms were probably a bit quicker onto acquisition opportunities. So they were saying, okay, look, we can make this company financially stronger than it is. And if there's a weaker competitor that, that looks vulnerable now because of what's happened, we could actually, you know, we could buy them. We could buy in that technology that we've always wanted. We could buy in that. You know, they may be active in a number of different countries. So I think there's a different tone there. There's, there's more similarities than you might think, but I think the nature of them is, is fundamentally different. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. I do talk in the book actually more about how private equity boards differ from uh, public company boards and, and private company boards and family company boards. Thanks, Patrick. Now, I've got a question for Milton, actually. <laughs> oh. And I see uh, my, my question is really, um, Milton, have you ever been on a board with Patrick? Yeah, actually, we've been on the Warwick um, uh, Africa uh, project, which Patrick uh, founded uh, from Warwick University, where we bring out the students in uh, Warwick University to Africa, Ghana, Tanzania, and South Africa. They come to teach mathematics at high school. Was it? Uh, and Sorry. Sorry, there we go. <laughs> and <laughs> Patrick, I muted you. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I'm back again. Yeah. <laughs> So um, yeah, yeah. So we 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 spent uh, a few years on that board, and uh, it's something that is fulfilling, um, where you see uh, how children who at the beginning of the visit from the uh, UK students from Warwick University, uh, they have low mathematic marks, and they don't know anything about subjects like probabilities, and um, by the time they leave six weeks later, these guys in Alex Township, in Soweto, in Limpopo, are hitting upwards of uh, 70%, 80% in a subject that they thought um, they could never understand. So um, it's been fascinating to watch how Patrick actually um, uh, handled that board and, and the trust. Um, he is a pro, he's uh, certainly first grade, just at my own personal experience level, even before I read the book itself. Thanks. And um, then a question from me to Patrick. Um, aren't people sick about hearing of, about governance? I mean, isn't governance, it was there, it's there, and it's never going to change. I mean, aren't people sick about hearing all of this stuff? Well, I think boards are a lot more than about governance. So when you think about the role of the board, I think it's to make sure the organization's got the right strategy, the right resources and the right governance. And I think if you think it's only about governance, I think you miss a big opportunity. So to my way of thinking, actually, it's a never ending learning. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've sort of been involved in boards for, for a long time, but Every, I can tell you every week I learn something. It's, that's one of the most exciting things. Um, and I, I think the art of being a chair is it's really difficult to be a chair, to do it well. And, uh, and I always think, oh, God, I wish I chaired that board meeting better. And, you know, uh, so I, I don't, I, I've never found that boring. I do find, you know, endless um, uh, governance discussions can be boring but governance in the context of trying to achieve something. So if you take Warwick in Africa, you know, an important part of our governance is safeguarding, both for the children that we help and for the, for the volunteers that, you know, we're, we're bringing people into to, to challenging places. Um, and also with the young people that we're helping, you know, they become vulnerable if they're different to the others because they're now suddenly good at maths or something, particularly the girls. So, you know, I, I think it, governance is really, really important. It's like the, the plumbing that enables you to get the water to the right place and to have a nice hot bath <laughs> um, and, and, and do that thing. But it's not an end in itself. Thanks, Patrick. I'd like to ask Alison Davies, if you're still on the line, um, she asked a question about what profession, is she online? Alison, do you want to unmute yourself? Ask your question. I'll do a quick one while she's, she's getting ready. Yeah, There's one, yeah. a great one from Nizrati here. Can we talk about governance without 
ES, i.e. ESG. Um, I, I think the implication in your question is that we can't, and you're right. So one of the things that's really interesting is that when you look at how businesses create value, so we did this work at, sorry, we looked at, you know, where, where is value created? What you find is two thirds comes from earnings growth, quarter comes from growing the multiple of those earnings that you might sell the company on, and the rest is small amount is financial engineering. When you look at how do you get a bigger multiple when you sell a business from when you bought it, what you find is um, it's really easy to sell a company that's got a highly engaged workforce, a really robust, good supply chain that has no environmental issues, no legal issues, no tax issues uh, that people like. It's really hard to sell a company if it isn't good on those ESG things. So I would always argue with, with entrepreneurs that, that actually don't do these things because you think they're good, although they absolutely are. Do them because you'll make more money. And I used to find that would appeal um, in, in a much easier way and persuade people, be more persuaded, persuasive than being sort of righteous or self-righteous uh, about an issue. So I, I, I hope you would see through, um, through my, my sort of long kind of involvement in a number of things that I've always, I've always banged that drum. Um, and I, I think it's, um, it's really important. So that's a great question, Nizrati. Thank you. Um, Milton, do you have any you would like to ask? Uh, yeah, um, uh, very many actually. Uh, Patrick, can you just touch on that basic relationship between the chair of the board mm -hmm. and the CEO and what happens when the CEO is also the chair, that whole sort of complexity. Yeah, and, and this is where Venn, John Venn, the wonderful John Venn comes into, into play. So I imagine the kind of a spectrum of involvements that a board and an executive and a chair and a chief executive can have. So at one end of this spectrum are two circles which don't meet at all. And the board and the exec and the chair and the CEO are in parallel universes. You know, they live in their own little worlds. They may tolerate each other for the moments that they do have to come together, but that's about it. And then at the other end of the spectrum, the two circles are completely overlapping. And the chair is trying to do the CEO's job and the board is trying to do the exec's job. And it's a muddle, it's a mess. And there's usually a war that ensues. And in the middle, you have this perfect state, John Venn's perfect state, where you have the two circles and there's a neat intersection uh, it's not a big intersection, but it's a productive intersection. And that's where they're discussing the strategy, the big decisions and so on. And the chair is running the board and the CEO is running the company to use the old description uh, of, of, of this. And the executive really are responsible for ensuring you've, you know, developing the business plan, delivering the business plan and maintaining that financial and operational integrity. That's what they should do. Healthy relationships between chairs and CEOs are where there's a lot of trust. Um, there's kind of a, a lot of, um, you know, they have differing views on lots of things, but they have a good way of dealing with those. And um, one of the interesting things is that as boards have become more diverse, it's harder to get agreement. Uh, it's kind of obvious, really. If you want diverse views, you're going to have diverse opinions. Um, and the same is true of chairs and, and CEOs. I think you can watch that chair CEO relationship and sometimes it's, 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 not, it's not healthy and not for logical reasons, it's just a physical human kind of chemistry thing. And that's hard to make that, hard to make that work. Um, succession is another big issue, but that's, that's a, a whole separate topic. But I hope that answers the question. Oh yes, yes indeed. And the you know, we have um, a, a very interesting scenario playing itself out here in South Africa. We have a minister of police who used to be the commissioner of police. Mm -hmm. And um, he is literally day by day at every operation of the police. And uh, we don't see the commissioner on the ground. And I was thinking about this relationship about the CEO, mm -hmm. Uh, versus uh, the uh, chair of the board, because uh, the minister ought to be 
sort of overarching rather than in a more operational sense. I mean, he's working with the police with the guns in crime scenes almost daily on television here. And uh, I've been sort of wondering where the boundaries are. And, and I suppose that happens in other boards without politics being involved. Com completely. I mean, the important thing is to talk about it. So also what you find is, you know, a particular chair at a particular moment has particular skills, experience and capabilities, as does the CEO. And the, the important job of the chair and the CEO is to agree who's going to do what when it's in that intersection. Um, the chair shouldn't be trying to do the CEO's job and vice versa. Um, you know, in terms of representing the organisation, you know, both have a role to play. Um, so tomorrow, for example, I'm... I'm um, representing EY Foundation, uh, an event for, for young people. The CEO's on holiday. I think it's really important she has a holiday. So I'm, I was more than happy to, to do that while she's away. But, you know, she does 90% of those, not me. And there's one from uh, Sean Lyons here saying, um, how can board members help ensure uh, that their corporate strategy has uh, is that uh, corporate strategy has a healthy balance between focus value creation and value preservation? Well, that's down to risk management as well as opportunity management. And so I think, I mean, the way I've often approached this is um, in terms of sustainability, you know, you need financial sustainability, you also need market sustainability, you need organizational sustainability. You need to keep your people who are really good. You need a refreshing as well. It's it's similar sort of balance. One of the things I found really instructive during COVID was I, I, I sort of, the moment the thing broke, I, myself and a number of other chairs sort of, we, we had a, a, a session together to talk about how we're going to deal with this. And, and a few of us decided actually, we've got, you know, we need a group of people mix of board and exec to focus on the here and now. There's a lot of survival stuff to do, but also we need some people who aren't necessarily in the fire of today to be thinking about how this might play out. What would be our choices? What would be our strategies going forward? And so we would form, you know, little huddles, if you like, of, of a couple of board members, a couple of exec, focus on the here and now. So those, those non-execs would support the exec, you know, more than would be normal, but absolutely right for the time through that through that real deep crisis point. And then this other group would be more reflective, out and about more, finding out, understanding, you know, what 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 the implications of this were. And then we come together. And so we would have, you know, because it's very hard to think about the future when you're stuck in the here and now in a crisis, I think. Um, so that that was one way I found a very a good way of balancing short and long term because if you don't look after the short term you've got no long term um and, it, and if you don't think about the long term you've only got the short term i know we did touch on governance but there's one from tembisile how can sme incorporate governance in their business operations because <clears throat> when things go wrong the importance of governance is elevated i i, I think it's back to the the triangle tembisile I think it's kind of purpose, people, and process. So you look at any operation. I mean, I, I chaired a smart materials chemicals company uh, for a time, and you look at that operation, and you, you you look at that, and you say, you know, you need to understand the operation, um, how it works, what's the model for that working, and that's everything from yield to um, health and safety to all of those things, and you need to put the processes in place so that the uh, as I said before, the water flows and in the right place at the right time and in a controlled way. It's not showering uh, out all over the place or it's not running dry all the time. And the Linda, people process. Yeah. Linda Vanana says, um, thank you so much, Patrick, for such insightful and thought provoking presentation. I like the use of mathematical analogies. I have never thought of using mathematics in the ways you have shared with us. So um, there's a good point on mathematics there, Patrick. I, I was trying to encourage you to move from maths to poetry, but uh, not so. <laughs> oh, I can do the poetry as well, but I, I yeah, that's, that's very nice. Thank you. How can boards 
leverage visualization to counteract numeracy challenges. I think this is a, a fantastic uh, pointer in Dave. And I think the ability to communicate data uh, is as important as the ability to understand it. And I think in the David Spiegelhalter book, The Art of Statistics, I think there's some good, good stuff in there. I think the technology is helping us enormously. You know, some of the tools like Power BI and, and others now are really helpful. Um, what you have to be careful of is though that the you have to understand the assumptions behind the pretty pictures and behind the infographics. Um, you know, knowing when, a, when that data was taken, uh, knowing, re understanding the demographic of a sample size, or all of those sort of things, you've got, really got to get behind to really, to really understand it. So, um, so yeah, thank you. And Walter Average, uh, many misunderstand the purpose of governance, which is to enable and liberate the organization. I mean, we've dealt with governance, but um, it's a great comment there. Um, any more? I think the one from Rafil is, is really good, Milton. Do you want to read that one out? Rafil Way. I can't see that one. There's so many here. Uh, sorry, Carol and I sent it directly to you. Oh, you did. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, well, Rafil Way, you ask your question. Okay, thanks. Um, do you now have increased optimism regarding uprightness being restored into boardrooms, particularly in the investment space? Do you believe that highly qualified and skilled professionals now feel safe enough to ensure up to standard governance without experiencing the past persecution, some of which are only recently being exposed? I think, um... I mean, in life, I often find it tricky to generalize because we're not homogenous as people in terms of our behavior. And, um, you know, uh, the basic human motivations, um, uh, you know, of, of sex, greed and fear, people do things when they're excited that they probably wish they wouldn't have done. People are encouraged to do things through greed and people sometimes make the wrong choices because they're they're frightened and i think that will always be the case so the the trick is actually putting the support around to avoid those things happening i'm a natural optimist as as milton said before i've seen particularly in the financial sector i mean interestingly the other week i was doing something with a very large organization a global recognized name uh, which is in the financial service sector and um, was looking, we, we were doing some board simulations for them around um, some difficult situations that were you know, hypothetical, but, but as a board, they wanted to know that they had the right way of dealing with these situations should they ever occur. And, and I thought it was very uplifting in two levels. One, that they would even think to do that, although the regulator obviously in some markets uh, expects people to do that sort of thing, but to the way that they dealt with it and the palm and the, although they knew it wasn't the real, real situation, we were simulating pressure, if you like, by throwing in curveballs all the way through the meeting, but the calm with which they showed and the fact they sort of forgot about their uh, their own personal wealth positions, it would it would have seemed, which, you know, you wouldn't have thought so 20 years ago. Um, and they were more thinking about their customers. They were more thinking about their staff. COVID has elevated, I think, for many, the importance of well-being of, of staff and suppliers and, and, and other groups apart from yourself. Um, so I'd, I'd say I'm optimistic, but I wouldn't be naive and think it's all going to be plain sailing. I think there will always be greedy people. There'll always be unpleasant people. And um, I think, you know, you just have to kind of understand that and, and, you know, use your antennae to spot them and use your interpersonal skills to, to manage them. Thank There's you one from much. Karen oh, Biden. You're going to carry on. <laughs> uh, should we do the last one from Karen? Sure. Um, one of the most pressing issues of our time is that of sustainability or ESG in governance and board terms. 
uh, our current boards really equipped and keep themselves informed of the latest developments in integrated uh, developments to integrate this with corporate strategy. I think we sort of touched that when we spoke about data and being across social media and so on. I, I, think, um, I think there's an element of catch up. Um, as a world, we've abused the planet. As a world, we've tolerated gross inequality for far too long and stood by uh, because it hasn't been in our neighborhood or uh, you know, we haven't seen it. Uh, and I, so I think we're playing catch up. So, but I think there's been a tidal shift. I think the combination of, um, I mean, appalling that it was the George Floyd situation, the, the, the dawning realization of climate change, you know, and young Greta's done a brilliant job um, at, at raising that attention with, and, and creating the sort of natural pressure that's that's needed but we're also having to learn a lot to understand a lot more i think we were thrashing around in the dark a bit sort of earlier on we're now becoming better informed about what will make the difference um, better equipped to make changes more quickly i think what the big consumer companies did on plastic very quickly was quite impressive you know, and if you think back to what a lot of companies did to to make sure the ozone hole you know no one really talks much about the ozone hole anymore that's because they kind of took really prompt action against um aerosols um in it, it in particular wasn't made a big noise of but that i think we're getting better but what i look forward to is when not only are we not doing as much damage which seems to me a pretty limp objective but we're actually recovering the environment. We are making really positive strides on, on global inequalities. And, and, and you know, ESSA, which I chair, is, is really trying hard at the moment to do something about women leaders in education. It's appalling that in Africa, only 2% of the vice chancellors are women, 2.5%, sorry, are, are, are women. There are only eight women professors in Ghana. Uh, I mean, we need to do something about this, not, not just say, oh, that's a big problem. We need to understand why is that happening and what we can do about it and mobilize the people who can do something about it to do something about it. So I think, again, I think, you know, we're humans, we fail. <laughs> There'll always be some crap to clear up. Um, but I do sense a tidal shift and a, and a generational shift towards dealing with some of these problems. But I just wish it would be more progressive than let's not do as much damage as we're doing. I think it needs to be a lot better than that.